office does in different organizations. And Aaron Carter in the breakout group that he was in, that group of people did that on their own. Uh, and so now we're going to put it into the room, just so you have it. So Aaron, could you read that? And then Aaron Malkin will put it on the blog. And it probably has more uh, relevance to the first uh, table and that first breakout, but at least we'll get it into the mix. Great. And so I'll just say it's some of these terms are umbrella terms that include some of the other things, but so, but as a group, we just kind of made a big list. So, um, things we are doing: season planning, reading plays, audience connectivity, lobby experience, marketing support, playwright relationships, writers groups, scouting, writer advocacy, post show discussions, workshops, readings, grant writing, in the room dramaturgy, catering. <laughs> on the list, uh, programs, newsletters, study guides, uh, various meetings, and of course, all of our administrative tasks. So that's the list we came up with. That's the, that's the sprawling. That's the sprawling. All right, <clears throat> this one we wanted to move into this, uh, the challenging area of this role, this uh, sense of uh, gatekeepers. And it's certainly uh, something that comes through loudly in the Outrageous Fortune uh, work. It came up a lot in the conversations that uh, were sparked around the, the closed submission policy at ARENA. Uh, and it comes up a lot in conversations, uh, especially in the world of the playwright, uh, playwrights who are relying on the open submission world. Uh, and it, it, particularly some of the, like you guys at this table, uh, a lot of people who are moving in through the, play, trying to move in through the play lab world or through the competitions world. I'm not sure how many of you actually have competitions. Uh, but it comes up all the time. And so I wanted to just talk about it a bit uh, here. Is, is there a sense, uh, do, you, do you feel yourself either perceived as or being uh, gatekeepers in this role? Or is this in this is the role whether or not it's about you, the gatekeeping role? At times, yes. Uh -huh. at, at certain institutions, and then at times, at times, no. I think it depends on the culture of the theater. Um, kind of, I think if if we look at the theater as an artistic home, which is thrown out a lot, instead of like having a gate at your home to kind of protect your home against the community. Think about like if, the, if the artistic office, the literary office is the living room, then you're actually bringing playwrights in, you're having conversations with them, you're saying, welcome, we'd like to work with you, let's sit down and talk. And so it's not a gate and a moat and a tower, it's a home with a living room. And I think there are some institutions that feel more that there's a, there's a moat and there's a gate and we're the century and that some have living rooms. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came up in our, our discussion um, that we just had in the breakout was it sort of about the sense of, um, you know, the pile getting burdensome or the... the Can you talk louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, the, the sense of uh, the pile getting burdensome uh, or the, the process of vetting material and managing that flow of material getting burdensome when there is not... Um, a particularly healthy alignment between the leadership of the artistic director um, uh, relative to the work that that or the tasks and the jobs that, that the rest of the artistic staff or and or literary staff are supposed to be doing that that the the, the sense of becoming a gatekeeper or or just managing traffic flow or just um, trying to keep the the wave of scripts at bay somehow tends to emerge uh, the more disconnected that process is from actually what the artistic director is interested in or, or an actual expression of a, of a forward vision that's mission-centric. Um, because the more specificity you have about who you are and <clears throat> the more specific leadership that you have, the easier it is to, to sort of figure out what your role is relative to the people who are approaching you, you know, and wanting opportunity. Um, it makes the messages easier to send because you know, you know what, what your purpose is. Um, and so as, as multifaceted as, as the tasks can become, if they're untethered to a common sense of purpose, that's when we run into a, a, a problem.
problem. I've, I've decided not to get too hung up on this gatekeeper thing. And I spent some time thinking about, yeah, is there a better name for it? Do, the, the living room idea is a good one. But the fact of the matter is, there are thousands of people in this country who are calling themselves playwrights, and my living room isn't big enough for all of them, you know? <laughs> so, um, I, while that term was being bandied about, I, I kept thinking about that scene in The Wizard of Oz, when they get to the Emerald City, and the gate is closed, and the gatekeeper <coughs> opens that little door to see who they are and decide whether or not he's going to let them in. Well, if we weren't there, there wouldn't be that little door even. The door would just be closed, is, is kind of my attitude. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, literary offices were created because artistic directors didn't have enough time in their days to deal with all of the scripts that were piling up in the corner of the building. That's why we were brought into the, the lives of, uh, of our theaters, is to, to help them deal with that. If we weren't there, the scripts would just keep piling up and the little door would stay closed, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, I try to, not be the gatekeeper, but more like the, you know, to open the door to, for people. And, and yes, does that, I, do I open the door for everyone? Absolutely not. You know, and, and is that sometimes unfair? I'm sure it is. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know what, I, I don't know what other model there can be at this point, given the structure that we have. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe there is, and maybe we can imagine a different one, but I, but I certainly don't, I mean, I don't take pride in, in keeping people outside the gate. You know, that's not where my pleasure comes from, and I don't feel like that's my job. I feel like my job is to try to create openings. And sometimes it's an obvious <coughs> opening, like we're gonna produce your play, come in. Sometimes it's figuring out, you know, more um, incremental steps in, inside. Um, but, you know, I, I try to look for openings yeah. for people as opposed to, keeping them at bay. Well, and the, and the other thing is that a gatekeeper, in the true sense of the word, stays on one side of the gate. And I think if we're doing our jobs right, we open the door and go out on the other side of the gate, and we talk to all of those writers to decide whether or not they belong in our living rooms. You know, we, we start to make those relationships that are happening on the other side of the gate. We also talked in our breakout about defining your gate. You know, if you align your submission policy with your mission, and with the uh, aesthetic of the organization, then there's less people banging on your door that shouldn't have admittance or are not currently in a position to come in. And the people who are knocking at your door, you can open the gate and say, come into my living room. But and How also, many metaphors can I put well, one <laughs> But also just, I mean, we were talking as well about we talk about, is the literary office the right phrase? Well, sometimes it's not about literary, it's about office. You know, if <laughs> the literary desk or the literary closet or the, so if you're inviting someone in and you don't have a place for a playwright to sit, it's kind of, it's showing that the value that that department has or the conversations have. You can't have a conversation with a playwright. There's nowhere for them to sit. You have to go outside of the theater to be able to sit somewhere. I mean, that's saying something about the value of the kind of connection and relationship you, you're, you're having with a playwright. So when we talk about an office, I think about a living room, what does it look like? Is there a comfortable place to sit? Can you spend time talking there? You know, because it's going to be conversations that then define everything else that's going to happen with that idea or, your, or the play. Um, in the play lab world, in, the, in your world, what's the, how does the gatekeeper resonate? In your well, I, I, we don't have the ability to really restrict our um, our mission to a specific style or genre, uh, um, and and we, we hope to also serve people at different levels of their career. So that makes it hard. Um, well, your mission uh, is to not is restrict. To, it, it, yeah, so it, to, to restrict that way. But in, inherently, the gatekeeper is the focus in some sense on the saying of no, um, and and I think that you're right in saying that you know it's the opening of the door, and that actually there's a whole lot of yes in just reading the script and taking the idea seriously and and just saying yes, I'm going to sit down with this and the yes of this idea uh, this idea is my is my business for this time um, and so I think there, there there is a lot of yes and I think that's part of the coming outside the gate is that we are we are saying yes in small ways very very often that are sometimes obscure to the rest of the community um, uh, and, and that is where I find the most value and joy in my own life is, 
is just the, the small yeses. And then, yeah, we let's figure out what path. But uh, I think there's a lot more yes than the gatekeeper implies. I mean, I feel I am also one trying to open the gate because there are projects that I want to get noticed and that I'm like, hey, Philip, you need to read this. Let's, open, let, let's invite them to our lab that I fight for personally. That's the reason, I mean, I feel Philip is at the actual gatekeeper where I'm just the one who, you know, I have a set of keys, but I can't keep the gate open all the time. <laughs> so, you know the secret box. I do. I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, can I, I help control the flow of what's going in and out, but I don't have, you know, I don't have that ultimate decision. And I don't necessarily want it. I mean, I'm more interested in trying to find someone who doesn't necessarily fit completely to what we want, but I think is an interesting voice and just bringing that person into the mix and having a conversation about it, as opposed to someone, you know, this perfect project that we will take to our lap. So. When Morgan Janesse told me her possibly a not by now apocryphal story of you know, getting hauled into Pap's mm -hmm. office mm -hmm. and, she's, and she said, I, I don't work for the public, I work for the American Theater. I, it gave me like an intellectual contact high like I never <laughs> thought yeah. existed. And I thought, that's it. That, that's what gets me off on this work. And in some ways, you know, the fact that I work for a, a little theater that does three plays, I say, okay, well, fine. You know, most, most of the stuff that we, we are psyched about is not going to be able to get produced, but I love this sort of, you know, Mark Ravenhill said I was like, hello Dolly, you know, and sort of making the connections mm -hmm. with people with, oh, this is a fabulous project, let's see how we can get you into this person's pile or this person's um, radar, and I, I think that is, I'd say, you know, half of my job is that, you know, half of my job is, yeah, looking for projects with a rep, but the other half is doing that, and I find it such gratification. And to speak to Liz's point about um, not having a place to sit with a writer, I think most of my week has been at La Cologne Coffee Shop on the corner of Liz Bernard and Church. But I, I, uh, I take that very seriously, you know, I am now going to leave this building and we're going to go and have a tete-a-tete -tete with a cup of coffee and I'm going to listen to what you are, what you are interested and excited about. I think um, it's just a different kind of message uh, to send to a writer. I also think it's kind of like a, a, this Monty Python sketch or something where it's like oh, this vision of the gate and like all these writers are trying to get in and there's like a drum turn going, no way, I gotta read all these scripts first or you know like, <laughs> it's like you know with all these people like, I don't have time to read all the scripts versus like but it's about the people. Like it's as if having a coffee with someone is gonna take up time from reading a the pile that you need to catch up on, it's actually it's like, it's the conversation at the coffee shop that's going to be really important, and yet it feels like all the knocking is getting in the way of the pile, like, it's like this, the efficiency gets broken down because humans are coming. And, and, <laughs> and how do we move away from the industrial <coughs> age into this next, you know, the jazz communication, like it's actually about the people. And you had this provocative notion last night, is that maybe there's not actually a problem here. Maybe. maybe the plays are getting done, and playwrights are being served, and there's more people wanting to be served than can be or would be in any system. Well, no, I was just saying. I was just saying. In some ways, you know, we talk about the problem. I was like, well, have we really, have we really talked about if there's a problem? Um, plays are getting done. Playwrights are enjoying that their plays are being done. People are enjoying working with playwrights on the plays that are getting done. Not all plays can get done. I'm sure there, there are wrinkles in every system. I'm not saying there aren't problems, but I'm just wondering if we're yeah. making a problem bigger than... Well, there's a point, I mean, there's a, we work in an industry or a field where there are tons of people in every discipline who want to be in it, who can't be. Right. Or who can't be consistently enough to make a living or to feel like they're really in it. But, you know, I mean, I think we talk about a lot about within our own programming scheme at Atlantic about, well, is it our job, <laughs> is it our job to sort of satisfy the, what people perceive as what is owed to them because they've staked out territory as an artist? Or is it our job to make sure that we're affording opportunity equally? That we're not excluding people for, you know, uh, nefarious reasons or, you know, strange reasons, you know, that have to do with bias or something that, that you know, 
it's sort of the core of deciding whether there's really an issue is about sort of how you orient yourself to like, well, what, what, what do we owe people, I guess? So what, what is the, what is the, what, what is the mission of the organization, and what, what is that? How does that dictate how you traffic? How do, what constituencies are you really trying to appeal to? Are, are, are too many of these theaters that are struggling with the identity of their artistic staffs or their literary offices mired in it because they are uh, trying to do too many things to too, too many different people, or are their artistic staffs sort of segmenting their jobs because the thing that they thought they were supposed to be hired for isn't actually is is broken somehow internally, so they're having to focus their efforts in other places. You know that um, I don't know. I'm sort of just riffing there, but but I think. There's an essential question, and that's sort of who you serve and what, what, what the purpose of what the organization is, and whether anybody's sort of fundamentally owed something because they said they were a thing, whether it's a player, a designer, director, or actor. We don't tend to treat actors like they just fundamentally deserve something just because they say they are. You know, and, um, there's a dialogue that's an awkward dialogue between institutions and artists that sort of kind of has to happen a lot about like, well, we've given you access, we don't necessarily have to give you. Opportunity. We give you opportunity. We don't have to necessarily give you production. Um. Well, and there's that thing we were talking about too. You know, it's nice to be all fluffy and warm and all welcoming and everybody's equal. And but the fact is, you know, there's an Anne Mercenary wet blanket. They're not all equal. There's work that needs to be done and there's work that doesn't need to be done. And I don't know where we got to the point where we're not afraid to say no to actors. We're, why are we afraid to say no to playwrights? Or why is it a bad thing to say no to playwrights? I mean, that's, I want to be as encouraging as possible, but sometimes it's... We don't want to own the subjectivity of that a lot of the time. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to ask, is, you know... Yeah, we don't want to own the subjectivity of that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. yeah that, 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 the, that in, in the gatekeeper, in some sense, we're, we're assuming that, that you can have an expertise in deciding the worthiness of, of this subjective experience. Yeah. And it relies on us essentially saying that, yes, you can become an expert uh, in this way and be a filter for a larger community. If we were to say that there was a problem, and I don't know that there is, what is the other alternative? And for me, the other alternative is only, it, it would only be a kind of mass reading of plays that's, you know, you know, involving all of the American public. So instead of us standing at the, the, the gate, people are being thrust forward by other communities. Um, uh, I can't see, I, other than expert, it's only kind of wisdoms of the crowd. But to do that, you have to get to such a high level of readership that I, I, I don't know is possible. Well, the, the irony of all of this is like all of these issues are kind of like brought onto by ourselves. I mean, we could actually plan our seasons with just the playwrights who we know from MFA programs and all of this, but we go out of our way because we want 10 page submissions and we want to, you know, we want someone from Ohio to be able to submit to us and we want to give that play the satisfaction of a full read. I mean, we tell our readers, read cover to cover. Like, don't read 20 pages in and give up because there could be something in it. And <coughs> And because of that, like we're going the extra mile, but at the same time, it's just a burden on ourselves. Like we don't have to do that. I mean, we can be the American theater without people, without MFA people from Ohio in the mix. But we love that, and like that's what makes our jobs exciting. Is when we do discover that new voice or that new person, and that's the reason we fight for the stack. So. I mean, I, I think what Christian said resonated for me. I mean, I think you know that it's. I mean, we all know that it's a fiction that there's somehow this objective, you know, great play and that everyone agrees on it and that, you know, and then there's objectively, you know, mediocre plays or bad plays. I mean, but, you know, that, that, that I have taste, you know, I have ideas about what's going to work and what's not. I also have, I mean, I'm reading for a particular theater, so I have ideas about what I think a, will work in this theater and B, will appeal to the people that I'm reading for the artistic leadership. You know, and I think the best I can do is, is own my own perspective and try to be honest about why I'm responding to certain things and why I'm not responding to other things and try to be clear about, I mean, I say to people who are reading for me all the time, like, you know, the goal is to try to, you know, look at what the play and what is the play trying to do and how well is it doing it and, and 
try to set, you know, be aware of your taste and what you're bringing to the table as a reader and who you are and what appeals to you, but to know that your taste is not ultimately the only, you know, is not the primary deciding factor as well. It's, it's an element. But I mean, all of this is, yeah, it's subjective and... And we've all championed work Absolutely. or produced work, which by all of those usual standards wouldn't measure up yes. because we respond very personally to it because it's it's speaking to us on some very elemental level because of the voice mm -hmm. of the writer or because of the subject matter or because of the way the story is told or because of the way it breaks convention it could be anything but you know we break those we Absolutely. break those standards all the time when we're actually making programming decisions so on the one hand I think it's fair to say to people who are reading for you and getting like the first le layer of vetting material like this is the way I want you to think about this process but we're happy to be subjective when we love something, you know, and, and we, but we, get the we need to own it on the flip side too, mm -hmm. which is like, at the end of the day, we don't like this enough. It's not, if, you know, whatever structural assessment you might have in the play, if you're getting a letter that says we're not doing the play anymore, it's because someone at some point in that process didn't like it enough and now the duck is not and, and that's not, and not that you want to put it that way to people because that's harsh, <laughs> but, you know, but that's what's true. That's what's true. And, and that, and that's the gatekeeping role. And, and well, it is, but it, but and that's where it, that's where the gatekeeping role I think gets fuzzy for playwrights who are getting mixed messages in the way that they're being communicated with by theaters. You know, it's it's it is a gatekeeping role. I don't I, gatekeeping does sound like such a it's a defining itself as as a barrier as opposed to a kind of well well the way you just described it, which yeah. makes sense to me, is that you're it's there's a it's distributed uh, the reading is distributed and the at some point along the way that it wasn't loved enough to keep going. Yeah. And that could be any part of along the way. It could yeah. be the very first person two layers out who yeah. actually doesn't come to the theater, yeah. um, who reads the theater. Uh, and I don't know about your situation, I'm saying I don't know how you get through it, but, yeah, yeah. but that, that, that didn't love it enough can go way down there, mm -hmm. or it can come all the way up all to there. the artistic director. Yeah. Um, and that's, so it's not even a gate, it's a series of, of gates. It, it gets to what, um, Morgan was saying in her phone call about the, she got into it to say yes and found that it was mostly a collection of no's. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's actually a sequential collection of yeses that are required to get into that, better read this in 48 hours kind of thing. Well, do you want to be the gatekeeper slash killer of dreams? Or do you want to be the gatekeeper slash mentor enthusiast? And sometimes you have to be both in the same day, in the same pile of scripts. That's hard sometimes. I think it, for, for yeah. a writer, I mean, I remember a long time ago, um, I was doing a play at Actors Theater in Louisville, and I was invited to go you know, meet and talk about the play in the office, and I saw 4,000 plays, yeah. and I said, I, I was like, I don't want to meet me. I don't want to think, <laughs> I don't want to think about this. And I, I mean, I think it's foolish for playwrights not to know what the kinds of seasons look like that different theaters do. It's, you know, that's foolish. That's just not good business sense. But I think it's also foolish to think too much about it, to, as far as what plays you're going to write or what you're going to do is, is more, um, I mean, that's why I guess I do, you know, I'm older. I do like the open submission thing uh, because it's not so much that you think you're going to get this, you know, pie in the sky. Although I will say a couple times that has happened, um, but it's actually that you begin to build up this network of relationships and people that you think, you know, when I finish this play, he'd actually read it. It doesn't mean that that that's more how stuff happens. But I I almost don't want to think about what goes on in these offices. Like I really don't because. You know, you have to write the plays that are most urgently in you to come out. And then after that, I think, well, you know, be a big girl and send it out and take your blows. I mean, Helen Merrill, who was my, my first agent, and I was, you know, in tears about something. And she said to me, no one asked you to write these plays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and I thought actually that was good. It was like, buck up. Buck up and um, it's tough. You know, it's full of rejection, and but that I feel like the lobbying them out there, you now and then you find your tribe, and they're scattered around the country. You know, and they, um, 
So yeah, I am now going to plug my ears because I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just so. want to say that a word that keeps coming back to me is something that Jerry said the first day about just humanizing. And there's something to me when, when I hear people say, like, I sent my play to, and fill in the theater thing, talked about this a little earlier, like, I sent my play to South Coast or to the Lions, or, as if it's, you send your play to a building and then the build, or, you know, the Lions rejected me, or South Coast rejected me. Like, the building said no. <laughs> you know, and, but the, but the people, it's like I sent my play to, you know, that, that, that it is relational. And so to be able to be honest about, yes, people read my play in this building with walls. They felt they had certain reactions and maybe hopefully it'll be transparent. And, you know, this was, if you have a relationship with this person, you know what, this one wasn't our favorite. We love other or whatever the, whatever the conversation is, but it's, it's human. I mean, we're not robots yet reading these and it's not, again, walls that are just, like if you stick the spaghetti, you stick to it, we're going to do it. If not, the theater wall rejected you. It's, you know, it's people. And so to be kind of honest about the kind of conversations we're having, we send it to people that we might have affinities with and we can have an honest conversation because we're, that's what we, I feel like we're doing in this business. We're building our network of, of alliances and collegiality and friendships and you kind of find where like meets like and taste and you have those honest conversations. That's where I would, I'd like to, you know, like we to sort of turn, to turn the question of rejecting play a little bit towards all was the possibility of being a positive experience, though, is that I really believe that, that one, well, one of the reasons why playwrights may perceive that they're sending a play to a building is that the way that they're being responded to suggests the content of the, the letters and emails that they're getting often suggests that the building rejected the play, that no, in, no one individual did, uh, which isn't the truth as far as I've, I've experienced it. And so being able to write to a playwright particularly one that, with whom you might want a relationship down the road or, or whose work you do essentially admire and say, this, this, the buck is stopping here. This is, this is not going to go forward. Here's what I like about your writing. Or I'd like to meet you if you're in town. Or I, you know, or I wouldn't, you know, I mean, or you don't say that if you don't mean it. You know, that, that, that being able to take the personal risk, the humane personal risk, as somebody on the inside of, uh, of rejecting someone who might get angry or upset or stalk you or whatever it is, um, is is actually the way to be able to build a relationship, if even if not with that person, or to build a reputation for somebody who traffics that way, as someone who traffics that way, so that people will look to you for your feedback or, or for what? a relationship that's real, as opposed to just being the stand-in for that number of years that you work in that building that tends to reject plays. It's about the honesty of it. It's the honesty of your mission, the honesty of your submission policy, the honesty of your rejection. I, I was loving what Lauren was saying this morning about um, here's ten places that do accept open submissions. So, you know, we don't, but here there's something, you know, I think that should go out with every letter if you're, you're sending something back to someone that you think should be in, but can't for your reasons of your mission go forward in your organization? I'm curious about, I woke up thinking about this today, is this notion of honesty. Because I think it is really important, you know, and I certainly um, don't want to lie to people, and, and I think it can be destructive and waste people's time. And, but I also, uh, I question whether we actually all want honesty all the time about everything. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that there's, and what, the, and what that means exactly, like what that really looks like. Because um, I, I know that, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I spend a lot of time not being entirely honest in my life, you know, That's in my just work. That's time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, here, I, I'm the only one, though, I guess. And sometimes that's wrong. You know, sometimes I feel it in the moment, like, Mm, I, that what, I wish I hadn't done that, or you know, I'm hearing some things that people are saying, and I'm thinking about some of my own practice and thinking, oh, you know, maybe I need to really rethink how I'm doing that because it's not. But then I also think about ways in which you know I could have been honest at that particular moment, but I'm not sure how good that would have been. You know, I don't know how much that would have helped that relationship or that play or that conversation. You know what I mean? Like I just I I wonder about always. Um, and I'm not saying we're necessarily doing this, but always saying that honesty in all, you know, and, 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 not, and I'm not sure that we all mean the same thing when we're saying being honest. So me, that's my thought. For me, honesty just comes also to the fact of it is subjective and I may be totally wrong. 
Look, uh, I, I mean, I, I, there's numbers and numbers of words that have come through and not gotten through and have had amazing lives. And, and that's, just, that's just the nature of the beast. And so I feel, you know, at a certain point, you know, um, the really hard one is, I liked your play, but I didn't advocate for your play. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, yeah. that's the really hard thing to say to someone that you like the writer, you like the play, but you, you didn't advocate for it. Um, that's a point where I think maybe I could do better with my honesty. Um, but in general, I also think that when I don't like something, my honesty is helpful. Um, oh, I agree. Because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the guy. Uh, right. uh, I'm not the one who wants to carry this water uh, with you. So my, uh, my honest, grotesque assessment of your piece may be absolutely invalid. Oh yeah, my, my, my manifesto, I was thinking about the manifestos yesterday, like if there's one piece of the manifesto I would write, it would be... Can you speak out? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just thinking about the manifestos yesterday, and one of the things that I was thinking about, like if I was writing one, would be, can we please have a moratorium on copious feedback to people who we are fundamentally rejecting? Yeah. Like, yeah. There's no reason they yeah. should listen to right. us. Yeah. Because we might be wrong. There's no reason to say because we have an MFA or a position that... that our assessment of the flaws in someone's work when we're not interested in that work <laughs> is what they should take forward as they're looking to find the next theater to go to or or, or rewrite their play. But, but, then it's a catch-22 because yeah. it's like how do you be honest with these playwrights and at the same time you're like I could be wrong why listen to me so it's like how do you give the value to the rejection letter if you know. But that's what I'm saying like don't say that just yeah. say if you really don't want to pursue the project just say you're not pursuing it. Let them come to you if they really want it, and then you can or cannot give them feedback. But like this, there's a there's a, there's a problem out there, I think, with offering up criticisms of a work to substantiate the rejection when, in fact, you're not looking for a relationship. Right. Tell them your story about having to change your submission letter. Oh. At Sundance, we had a, a few years ago, we had a submission letter, and Janice may know this, where it was so nice and people actually thought it was being personalized to them. And I would get phone calls and be like, oh my god, I'm so inspired, I will write plays forever. And I'm like, well, oh my god, you weren't even, we didn't even like your play, it wouldn't even pass the first round. But it's just that perception. And it's hard too because the playwright will see what they want to see in a rejection letter. So I mean, it's like we can't control their perception as in our letter. I mean, like we actually had to make it a little bit tougher because you know, they would want, we changed our rules if we no longer submit, uh, accept plays that have been re submitted once before, but we just don't. But they'll get this super nice rejection letter, they were like, oh, but you liked it so much, and I did this work, don't you want to read it again? And then I had, you know, no, we have this rule. And the question got posed to me, like, well, are you honest enough with them to say that if you had liked their play enough, you would make the exception and bring it back to the ring? And I, you know, I'm not honest enough with them, and maybe I should be, I mean, it's just, when you get to that honest level, you are engaging them in some way, and that adds an extra level of work to me. I mean, like, if I'm working on a pile and I'm trying to get through that, engaging on the people from last year's pile, I'm like, how do I have both, how do I keep both of those balls in the air? And you, and as, you know, you're trying to act as a responsible American theater person and go forward, but, you, you know, you can only do so much. And so... Well, and I think it's also about how many people you think a playwright should be listening to at any given moment. If right. I'm not going to produce your play, I shouldn't be one of the two or three maximum people that you should be listening to for notes. And we're very resistant to giving writers any notes until after we've pulled the trigger completely and said, yes, we're definitely producing it. Now let's have a conversation about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not about people being fragile, or about, but it's about not wanting to be a voice in the head for someone that you're not going to be useful to because you're not in love with the play to begin with. Right. I mean, Christian said something in our group, you know, it's a matter of trust. If you can't have those conversations with playwrights unless there is some kind of relationship and there's a trust level there. So to engage in those relationships with people who are, you know, absolutely strangers to you, it's like you don't even have the dialogue with them to even go through these conversations. So like, it's, it's almost not worthwhile in any I just think there's a, there's an element of ego in it on the theater side to suggest that you know that that they should somehow absorb or take detailed criticism uh, without that trust by virtue of the fact that the letter comes with Atlantic Theater Company letterhead. You know, but, but that, I, I just think that's presumptuous and, and not you know I think my own subjectivity is significant enough that I just I don't know why I would take the time to 
to the care of parts of this play that way. I think what? it's helpful though, um, it's the same I think with an actor auditioning, that if you're told no, you're not right for the role, <coughs> that if, I, if I'm in the director position, that I will sometimes say, you gave a terrific audition. Like, I, I kind of want them to know, and so for a writer, I, 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 I don't mind hearing flat out no, but it's nice if they actually really like to write it. Oh, I think you should say that. That's true, for sure. not a big yeah. long thing, but that, that's enough. And you think, you know, or someone says, honestly, send us your next thing. Right. Or if they say, you know, mm. staff all liked it, this isn't going to be our artistic director's cup of tea, try us again. Like, that just feels very clean. But I think like, we've all done that. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. we... Yeah. I mean, when we read something that, and we know it doesn't fit into our season or our lap, I mean, I do that all the time. I mean, I'll have coffees with someone, or I'm just like, I mean, yeah, I'm like, submit to me, and, you know, I flag their project and send it to another, you know, there's ways to help. I think that's the kind of language I'm advocating. Yeah, it's yeah. not, it's, it's just, d don't follow that then with, and by the way, here's the five things that are wrong with it. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, it's onerous on you then, too, you know, to have to do that that much. Let me let me um, ask something else. Then. So if we, if, I still want to understand why there's the perception of a problem in the outside world, but in this uh, the circle of people doing it, there's not there's less of a perception of a problem. Um, but but then when you get to let's say it gets all the way through all of the levels, and now we're and we're moving into the world of you think yes. What? How much? Uh, what happens there for, for, in terms of John or, or any of you who are, have been at your theaters for a very long time? It's probably different from people who are newer in the theater. But what, what is a yes, uh, when you find a yes, what do you then have to do with it? Do you, you, get, you don't program it. No. No, uh, if it gets to yes with me, that's the script that I walk into the artistic director's office and say, I think we should do something with this. And I work at a theater where that something can be a lot of different things. Okay. Uh, uh, lots of different avenues to, to move it forward, whether it's the Pacific Playwrights Festival or we have a, a Monday night playwriting series, uh, play play reading series that, that, that we do uh, three readings a year in. Uh, it can just be an in-house developmental process or it can be an outright offer of production at that point. And I will uh, uh, um, offer an opinion to the artistic director about which of those many options I think is appropriate for a, for a given script. But that's what happens when it gets to yes with me, then it goes to the artistic director. And one of the things that we hear and, re and read in uh, Todd's study as well is that the, that whole process that the play has been through gets that far, and then it still gets the next no. no. And that there's not really any, you guys have precious little to none authority, little to no authority in the actual the yes that meet, that everybody's waiting for. Is that true in your experience? That you have little influence over, I mean, at that point then, let's, you have influence over what gets to yes. But then at that point, how much influence does the, do you guys have in your processes for getting it, uh, getting yes to mean something uh, that the well, theater engages in something? Well, if it's yes with me and no with the artistic director, that's not necessarily the end of the conversation. So you, you can move into other yeah. um, ways. I mean, it's, it's rare that once an artistic director has said no, I can get him, and it is a him in my case, uh, to, to change his mind, but I have been able to change his mind in the past, so I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the advocacy part of it. That's where not only are you saying to your artistic director, but you, know, you may say to somebody else, we passed on this, but hey, you should look at it. Yeah. Do, you, do you have the, when you say you have the opportunity to move things into other programs. Do you have a conversation with the playwright at that point? When when it's a yes for you, do you always talk to that playwright, whether it goes forward or not? Uh, I tend not to start talking to the playwright until I know the lay of the land at the theater. Because I know the fact that I happen to love a play does not necessarily mean it's going to go anywhere there. And I don't want to create false hope uh -huh. for the playwright. So, so I will wait until I know what the lay of the land is. And then the conversation with the playwright might include, you know, this was a near miss for us. We're excited about your voice. We want to keep reading your plays. Uh, but unfortunately, this one just didn't quite clear the last hurdle, you know. Um, but yeah. Are you likely at that point to have some level of relationship with the playwright already? I mean, not, not prior to the situation, but by that point in the process, this is not the first they're hearing from you. 
It might be the first thing. It might be. It depends on the writer. You know, if it's someone with whom I have a, a long relationship, then I've probably been in conversation with him or her along the way. But if it's a writer who's new to me, then not necessarily. What about you guys? In the, in the world of yes, what happens in your places? I mean, my world of yes is just getting a play to a finalist level. Because, I mean, as I said, Philip is the ultimate gatekeeper. So, I mean, I'm just trying to get a play to the top 25, 30 spots. And so it could have a fair voice in that one day when we, sh we select our projects. And, but a play that I say no to, could, or yes to, Philip can easily say no to. I mean, it's his. We, we try as much as possible to all be super psyched about the three things we do a year. Um, though ultimately, you know, it's the AD's prerogative, it's her decision. But, but it, it's a constant back and forth. And, you know, she said to me that she just really appreciates the palette of the five or six I give to her a year because they're, they're all valid, but it's just, it's this dance between her personal choice and what, what can we all get behind? Because it's five of us making this work. We have to be behind it to really be able to do all of the, the elements in getting into production. There's also a difference between little influence and not ultimate decision. Mm -hmm. Because right. we know yeah. we don't have the ultimate yeah. decision. We're not the artistic director. Yeah. Um, if you feel like you have no, if you have little influence and no ultimate decision, then it's like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And it's pile management, and right. then it is the soul sucking that Madeline was saying, is because there's this big disconnect. But you can still have a lot of influence and advocate and be at the table when the conversations about season planning are happening, and yet still someone else makes a decision. Mm -hmm. And if at least that conversation has been satisfying, you felt like you were listened and heard in the advocacy, and sometimes that play gets through, sometimes it doesn't, but the process to get to that conversation and decision has been rewarding, you know, your influence was felt and decisions were made, and you didn't make them because that's not your job. And, and then, that's, I mean, that's what we're hired for. That's we're also rewarding the job. How you're, how you're building that list. I mean, and things that you're advocating for and, and what kind of conversation that's coming out of with an artistic director about the mission of the theater and what your priorities are. We all know that you're not building programming lists just based on your own loves and tastes. Like, right. it, theoretically, you're filtering it through the lens of a mission. You know, we have an ensemble, so that's part of the, that's part of what I have to think about when I'm thinking about work that, that we're looking at. You know, there's, I mean, there's always the usual concerns that people talk about with money and budgets and venues and all that stuff, but, but, you're never, you're never just creating, I mean, I mean, maybe some people are just sort of handing over the list of things that they love and hoping that the, the artistic director will pick one from, you know, column A and one from column B, but if you actually have a transparent relationship with your boss, then it's actually, it's a more porous process than that. Mm. The, the, the buck does stop with that person or people, but hopefully your, <coughs> your work is being infused by their Interests, right. you know. So. But if, if asked about this thing about taste, I, I'm I'm struck by uh, you were saying, Martin, about um, the you, you, I'm not your guy. I'm not going to give you feedback about it. I, I didn't like it, uh, and I'm and I'm wondering, like, if, if look at this group, and and it, you know, we we did sort of curate this um, this conversation. What happens to plays that come from outside your taste? Whether it's you know other cultural communities, other forms. How does, what, I mean, that may or may not, I don't know, but does it mean that, that these things that are coming from outside that actually don't have a home necessarily, even at the end of the day in the institution? Or how do you, how do you manage your own taste uh, in relation to this pile, in relation to this work, when things come in such a, a range of... I think that's the development of expertise in, in the field, is that you can, you can not be generally excited by naturalistic you know, stages. But you know that that's not what you're necessarily excited by, and you can pick up something and see that that is done really well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the journey of you know becoming an expert, is going beyond personal preference. But that also d demands that you know your personal preference very, very well, um, to be able to see something outside and advocate for it. Because I mean, the list that we assemble, for me, it's a, a similar process of about 40 finalists, and it's diverse in form and content. Um, and, and and is not, you know, there are genres and, and plays in there that are not my personal joys, but that are works that I respect immensely. We have a joke at Sundance is that, are we going to find the next hip-hop musical? Like, and that's our, and like, <laughs> we don't know anything about you. Philip and I are like, whoa, hip-hop. 
<laughs> but I mean, like we, I mean, we actually had that this year where we had a couple of these like big hip hop musicals, and we could, and we're reading through it, and we're like, okay, we see a story, we see this, but I mean, like we're not responding to the material, so we actually go out and find a specific reader hmm. who knows that genre really well, and we trust their opinion. We're like read this and tell us what you think. And if they're like, oh, this isn't it, then we're like, okay, we gave this play its fair due. How many of you are doing that? Like, do you, you find well, that you have to go outside your own expertise to find? Um, well, when you work for, for an organization that has several people in the literary department, you can, you can kind of do that in-house. So right. I will sometimes read a play and say, this is not speaking to me personally, but it feels like there might be something there, so I'll hand it off to Kelly Miller, the literary manager, mm -hmm. to Billy Colburn assistant literary manager, or sometimes Martin Benson, the, one of the founding artistic directors, and say, give this a read, let me know, what am I missing here, if anything, and, you know. So a lot of the responsibility comes down to casting the literary office, mm -hmm. like, casting the, uh -huh. that group of people it, widely enough to truly represent your mission, to truly yeah. represent your purpose. Right. Or you can, I mean, I also will share, like, the Goodman has a group of artistic associates, many of them are directors, and I will, if there's a play that I think you know, I'm often sort of thinking about what might be a good match for a director, or, and I will share it with them too to sort of see, like, so that we can have a more ongoing conversation about what they respond to. And um, so I'll sometimes share it outside the you know literary department. Um, we shared a casting director. We shared a play with someone in our marketing department this year because we knew that it used a very specialized vocabulary that he was really well versed in, and that we thought it was really cool and interesting. But <coughs> we wanted to see what he thought of it as someone that was more of an expert than us. Like. I think it happens. We use our ensemble. It's, um, you know, uh, we use, you use your ensemble? Yeah, I mean, not, not formally, but there are several of them who will come to me and say, hey, I mean, what are you guys looking at? Can I read some plays? And I have some of them things that, uh, that nobody's read, and sometimes I have them things that I'm not sure I get or love, or, but there's something that seems to be something, or there's something the literary manager or artistic associate has passed to me that I disagree about, but there seems to be enough consensus around, you know, that, that it merits another look. I mean, we all have very different, all of our artistic staff have enough overlap, at least in my at Atlantic, I think, that that we um, can see the same values that the others see, whether or not a thing aligns with taste, so that it ends up usually being a fairly smooth process of advancing that uh, play forward. Uh, or, or figuring out where it should stop um, uh, based on taste or what we, what we imagine this taste would be. Uh, or, uh, you know, it's sort of a built-in, I think if you have the right balance among the staff, you end up with a sort of a healthy checks and balances. Okay. And sometimes what? the difference between, and when you talk about taste, there's taste, do you mean what quality or aesthetic taste? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, how, right. and how do you discern the difference there? Because sometimes they're totally related and sometimes two different things. Like I'm acknowledging, Aesthetically, maybe this isn't my thing. However, the artist director might love it. So, just acknowledging where I come, but I'm reading for you, so you might love it. Or, um, I don't. I, I'm not sure this is good. In terms of what I, I, but I need someone else to check because that also could be, or maybe an aesthetic thing is coming in to block me from. You know, so you need to kind of have checks that are both for quality and aesthetics. Well, listening to this conversation, it sounds like we're all doing everything right. Like, like, uh, and and that and we all have the things that we do that we're proud of the way we do them and that what what would we do better could we do better what and what need what is the baby here that's good that needs to come into the future but but it does sound very and and so I'm and the disconnect I'm I'm responding to is the amount of pressure and noise in the world about this this whole, that everything gets stuck here and that it's a monolithic kind of notion of what, what makes a play and that there's no access for new voices, there's no access for new forms, that things are stuck there and that it's stuck here in the literary office. And you guys don't feel that. I mean, I, I definitely feel that. I feel that it comes from people of color. Like, I hear this all the time, people coming up to me, it's like, why aren't you doing more Mexican plays? Why aren't you doing more of these plays? And I mean, I will be completely honest, when I read a play, I look for that. Like, I mean, I will earmark a play if I see, like if I get any type of good remarks, I'm pushing that through because I want to advocate for those. I mean, I, 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 mean, I hate saying this, but part of me feels it's an excuse. Like people don't know, they don't know what else to say about like why their play isn't being produced or why it's not going through these doors. So. I mean, you have to blame something. So you blame the system, you blame the establishment. I mean, we talked about in our breakout group, I don't understand now why there's a stigma about 
self-producing or going to smaller theaters. And like playwrights just don't want that. They want the taper, they want arena. They don't want to go to their local equity waiver house to premiere their show because it's not good enough for their work. When I don't necessarily see that as bad, like I mean if you you have work, get it out there, that's the point, like get it heard. But they don't want it to be heard by just anyone. They're picking their audience. So at the same time, it's like they're self-selecting where their work can be done because they want a big stage. So it's kind I mean it's it's a catch for me too. I mean, I recently got asked by a artistic director who's transitioning between two theaters and found himself in a situation where he had to program like five spaces because of where he was and where he was going. And he came to me and said, can you just put together some pitches and just pitch me some plays that I don't know, which is kind of the opposite of what we're talking about here. And it was a, a person who I know, but he's going from one theater with a very specific aesthetic to another theater with a different aesthetic. And I sat down and made a list and was kind of surprised that right off the bat I had 50 plays I wanted to talk to him about. Mm -hmm. And I, that the diversity that I had within those pieces, I was surprised myself. And when I sat down and looked at them, I was like, wow, I know more than I would have thought I had known. Yet, there is that idea of we're self-limiting. You know, we, I think we do it as we read work. We do it, our artistic directors do it, in a way where you think, well, I, I only am looking for this. We were talking yesterday about the two, person, two men, one set play. You know, I, I'm worried that we have propagated this myth that things aren't getting done or that things are being blocked when they're really not. There really is a lot, like you were saying, plays are getting done and there's a lot of them getting done. Well, I think part of, I mean, I don't know if this is addressing what you're asking, but I, I think part of what's be difficult and frustrating both inside and outside maybe is that you know there's this system so you, you know things get sent and then there's a process and people are reading and then it moves forward and and that is true like that process exists and as people have said like you know plays will come in and I might read something and be excited about it and pass it on and then the conversations will happen and that may lead to it being produced on our stage or it might lead to a reading that might then lead to something else or you know it, it can happen but then there's but that's only one of the ways that things get produced. You know, it's it's a way that things get produced, but it is not by any means the only way. And the other ways are much more idiosyncratic and much more to have to do with relationships and what people are excited about and what, you know, and so I think sometimes it feels like this is the way work is supposed to get on, and yet I, I from the outside or I from the inside realize that actually there's a million other ways that it happens. Right. And so does, is this way a waste of my time? Am I being lied to about what the process is of work actually getting produced? Yeah. And I don't think, it's not a lie because work does get done that way. But it's just one of the ways. But it's just one of the ways. And if work isn't getting done that way, that's the conversation it, that has to be had. Right? That, 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 that artistic jobs and artistic don't just have to have openly about why are we doing all of this? If, if year to year what we can see is this isn't how you're making your decision. Yep. So something either is broken on our side uh -huh. or you're not interested in what these plays are so we need to send a different signal out into the world about what we're looking for or you need to not have this stuff. Or, you know, I mean, right. those, are the, those, those are internal uh, conversations that, that maybe some theaters aren't having. You know, that if there's a perception of a disconnect there and a literary manager or some or drama or whoever feels like they're just spinning their wheels and getting their soul sucked out by the pile. It's because that's, that work isn't being seen on the stage. And that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't seem to me to be essentially a problem of the theater to the artist outside the theater. That's, a, that's an internal mm -hmm. Right. So, um, it, I mean, I'm really, I'm kind of stunned at this, but is, so is nothing of what Todd uh, study, for example, points to as broken? actually broken? Is it just the whining of, of uh, or the complaint of people who are in other ways disenfranchised or uh, coming, trying to come through one gate when another gate would be 
uh, more effective for them? Is this, is, is this in a sense, uh, a lie? It's a trick question almost. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, and because it's also a subjective question. I mean, I mean, there is no right or wrong answer to it. I mean, I would say that I, would, I really want to see more color on stages and I really want to see more female playwrights. And I feel like we're getting to the point where we're getting more females, but we're not getting more color. You know, and you, you hear like the color slot, like I hate those terms and like I feel like you've, we've had these in our vocabulary for so long and we still haven't broken free of them. And so, yeah, I mean there's still problems with diversification. I mean like all the major players in the American theater can be argued as white men and like where's the diversity there? I mean like there's so many levels to that simple question. It's like, you know, how do you approach it in a very simple way? You can't because it's too big of a question almost. I was surprised. We did a playwright survey of our 900 playwrights that submitted this year, and we had about 500 respond, which is a pretty <laughs> good response rate. Um, and the diversity within the group that applied was shockingly limited. Uh, of, of really, um, I mean, 80 percent or more uh, uh, white. So is that a function of how um, you're soliciting, or is that a function of what the pool is? I, I think that's a real question of what we can do better. And I think also beyond just the diversity of, of background and, and, and it's been our, our gender diversity and our gender numbers were actually we're actually developing more work by women than it was actually submitted percentage wise. Uh -huh. um, but um, the uh, for me it, it's it's also the question of diversity of background by education as well. Uh, I'm somebody who came through from uh, not again school of hard knocks as opposed to MFA. And um, uh, it's really hard to find the good writers in the pool that don't have uh, that don't have other other credentials to add to them. Partly because there are very few of them that exist. Um, that you get better as you go along the journey. Um, uh, but that's a really hard process, and a nut that I have not been able to crack. And one that I that with the amount of time, I, I wonder is is able to be cracked in this current model. Um, so we need to uh, break out so that you guys, can, the rest of you can get into this conversation. Uh, can we, when we do that, when you go into your breakout, start, try to answer some of these questions that these guys are wrestling with too. What is their problem? Is where it sort of feels a little bit like uh, what we're doing things well and right. Uh, there's a disconnect between the, the language of this, but then what is the, if we are in fact doing things well and right, what is the um, literary office of the 21st century look like? What, are, what, are you, what can we do better and what do we need to maintain as we, as we make this change as it relates to this question of the gates and, and selection and, uh, you know, ad advance in a form? Yes, playwright has the last word before we do I, it. No, I just wonder if the question is limited because it's asking if, if, and I'm not in that world, so if you're doing something right for the, st the existing story, I mean, uh -huh. isn't the larger question is, is the story broken? Uh -huh. And not, I'm not criticizing, or is the yeah. story, not broken, that's wrong, is the story shifting? That's what I think it is, so that it's almost like people are being forced to defend against something that has worked for what it has existed. But I think it's a seismic shift that's happening in all organizations, all business, all structure, that is affecting how we're going to create live performance, you know, performing live events. So I, I guess that's what, it, I mean, I think, you know, So what is needed to, as we move forward? And, and in the how to do live, like how is live performance going to go into, and is it going to, you know, that how, and I think it is. But I think it's massively shifting. How are we going to take in the live shared experience into the future? So that's, I guess that's what interests me. Because I think it's, yeah, I don't think people are doing anything wrong. It's just that I think we're in this massive shift. We're in this, you know, one room is worked and we're in this liminal in-between period before you expand into what the next possibility is. And so expand. In the breakouts, expand into the next possibility. And we're going to break out until 2.30. It's about 1.40 right now. So